Like you can only really experience love in and out of the context of sacrifice. And that's really one of the things that I know you don't want to, you know, build it up too much, but that was what you felt. That was like kind of like initial recoil of like, ooh, am I gonna do these services? Like, what is it? You know what I mean? Like, ah, and it's like, yeah, because, you know, it's like I tell, it's like I tell people when I, you know, give a penance for like giving alms, like, oh, like, what do I give? And I'm like, it doesn't really matter, but it has to stain. That, that, that's the secret. If it's not stinging, you haven't given alms, really. You know, so love, sacrifice, you know, anyways. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And I'm just right out the bat, I'm going to say I think we're back. We just got through Pascha, but I think we'll be back to more or less like the same recording schedule, the same release schedule, hopefully, God willing, because um, I'm going to forget if I didn't say that. So that's that. And then I'm going to ask you guys, if you've maybe been at like a Pascha picnic or something like that, and having been a vegetarian for a couple of years, ate a bunch of meat and got like really, really sick later that night and into the next morning and into even the next day. I don't know. It was just someone really random asked me to ask that question. You know, I don't know where it's coming <laughs> from or anything like that, but yeah, yeah. probably yeah. a prank. So don't worry about sausage it. fever. Yeah. Sausage. Did you eat sausage? I did. I ate everything. That's... I mm -hmm. ate everything. See, and I got lucky. I got lucky. I made sausage, a whole bunch of sausage, and everybody else ate it, and they didn't leave me any. They didn't leave <laughs> oh. me one. I had my eye on one, and then all of a sudden, it was like snatched. And so, you know what? I feel great. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen is you're going to get to heaven, and you're going to get a little piece of sausage. Because the <laughs> sausage that you give away goes to Christ. So, <laughs> it's great. It's great. Um, yeah, it's a rookie mistake. It's all right. It's all right. I think it is just because I hadn't eaten meat in so long. And then I just was like mowing mm -hmm. down on steak and lamb. I was honestly sitting next to father and father just kept cutting off little pizza pieces and just giving them to me. <laughs> and me, like an irrational human that I am, was just like, oh, yeah, let's just keep going. Let's keep going. Never minding the fact that I hadn't really had steak in about a decade. And then I ate it and then proceeded to get really sick, but not sick enough to stop uh, no. <laughs> definitely not but still kind of feeling it now so just think to take it easy but there had to be one of those one of those first times of getting back into eating meat but anyway uh now that we're out of lent i thought that we could ask uh what is because i was going to ask this last time but what is your guys's favorite um soundtrack to a movie like what's one that just really sticks out to you um because i've been doing a lot of soundtracks recently so mm. mine right off the bat is right now i've been rocking the batman actually has a really fantastic soundtrack uh is really really good and then uh there's a couple of comics that are really good to read to the blade rudder 2049 soundtrack actually is really really good to listen to when you're reading some stuff mm. perfect a perfect pairing with the recent beta ray bill release mm. the five issue five issue series by the guy who did murder falcon i can't remember his name right now but it's fantastic i can't really think of a well i can think of one soundtrack and maybe so that so maybe that's the one that stands out to me um and it's interesting that you say the batman soundtrack because the one that i was playing over and over and over again as a kid was the prince soundtrack of the first batman movie oh the michael oh. keaton batman yeah. movie the it Bat was Dance? prince <laughs> yeah all that all that that totally sticks out to me as i was like 
this is a great this is a great soundtrack but then i found out that he like that he really didn't even like that soundtrack that mm-hmm. he he did it and he was like and eh, i just did it i don't know it was either contractual or he some i think it was like a contractual thing that he like had to do it for warner brothers or something like that um they they like got one soundtrack out of him for his, from his contract or something but I really like that. I mean, there's there's soundtracks that I think are great in the movies, but I can't think of like, for instance, like Blade, right? Like the 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 first Blade. I think that soundtrack's incredible. But I wouldn't just. I don't know if I would just play it by itself. I can't think really? of one that I would just play by itself. No. Sometimes no. it works for me to have ambient music, like when I'm working mm. and stuff like that. They're actually on YouTube. They have Blade Runner Blues from the first Blade Runner. I know I'm talking a lot about Blade Runner. But not Blade Runner 2049, the first one on repeat mm. for 10 hours with rain uh, in the background. And I have gotten through that 10 hours before while at work, just like having it on the background just the entire day. And I just, you know. Well, I mean, the, new, the, the soundtrack of the new Dune is incredible. The Hans Zimmer soundtrack well, is crazy. It's absolutely incredible. It's yeah. like, it's, I can't listen to it sometimes because I get kind of too hyped up and too kind of like, <laughs> Ooh, like kind of ch- like that kind of spiritual chill, but mm-hmm. like not in a good way necessarily. I'm like, ooh, okay, it's it's kind of right there. Well, he's a you know, I mean, he's been a a uh, Hans. He's been a steady piece of the new age uh, soundtrack diet for all the way back to Tubular Bells, right on the uh, Pure Moods or whatever the heck it was that they would sell on TV. Um, Old yeah, Hans man. Z. Old Han Z, yeah. Old Han Z. He's a new age guy. I dig He's loved it. by the new age. So, Father, what about you? You got anything? Yeah, hands down, the Tron soundtrack by Daft Punk. Oh, yeah. Wow, that down. came out of left field. Hands down. Yeah. Man. Hands down. Good call. Good call. I, can't I, still, listen, I still listen to it. I'm going to have to give it another shot. I can't remember what it even sounds like off the top of my head. It's incredible. I was never really that big into Daft Punk. I'm only coming recently, thanks to a brother from the church, coming around recently to any kind of electronic music. I've just yeah, always... so, so to me, that, that proves the point even more because I'm not like a huge Daft Punk guy either or a huge, you know, quote unquote, electronic techno guy. Um, it proves the point even more to me how, how outstanding of a soundtrack it is. Because it's like... You know, I'm a guy, I appreciate, you know, I, I take a nibble from all the plates, right? But um, it's not per se my genre, and uh, it's incredible. <laughs> That's not da- true. Daft, Daft Punk are special, though. They are special. Like they're, they're special. They are special. Yeah, they're, they're, they're one of those, like, yes, yes, it's electronic, but, I mean, they're, they're definitely groundbreaking. They always have been. Can I ask you a question? Do you... First of all, I do have something to say. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Be yeah, I was just gonna say real quickly. That's my big thing. Is I tend to gravitate towards people who transcend genre. Yeah, that's that's I mean, my next question was gonna be. Was do you find, especially as you get older, that you tend to like? Because I used to, you tend to not focus so much on genre as whether or not it's just good music. Because I used to be, up until even just like a couple of years ago, be like. Oh, I'm really into this, like, whatever, like, DB, like, his hero's gone, like, DB, crusty, like, punk band. So I'd be like, well, obviously, I'm really into DB, crusty, punk. And then I would try and listen to other stuff and be like, I'm not really feeling the rest of this stuff. I just really just want to listen to this one band. And then I'd, like, pick and choose from, like, different genres. And then the best is when you find people who kind of just transcend, like, I'm, I'm going to continue to say it over and, but Beastie Boys transcend any genre, like, especially like in the middle of their career. So being able to find someone that's like, no, this is just a good song. I don't really care that I can't neatly label where it goes and how it works and all this different kind of stuff. Like I, that's a fairly new development for me. Cause I, I stuck to one genre of music for a good chunk of my, um, uh, adult music listening life so mm-hmm. yeah i've it, always like running across i've always thought like it's a great opportunity when you run across somebody who like clearly knows music but has distinctly different tastes from you and then you could be like 
what's the and they start talking and you're like and it's been great because because it's been great doing that even on uh, with this project to where it's like tell me what's good mm-hmm. like what's what's good what do you think is really really good and then i listen and invariably it's awesome mm-hmm. right invariably it's awesome it's like it's just like okay yes maybe you like things within a genre but tell me what's the best thing mm-hmm. what's the best thing and let me and but it's the same thing with so many things right like food yeah, uh, yeah. With, like anything fashion is, anything yeah which is great because you know one of the things is like this kind of subjective subjectivism the fickleness like you see, you start seeing right through it. Like once you actually begin to appreciate things, you're like, no, there's some things that are like objectively like good, you know? And it's, I mean, it's kind of a little rabbit trail, but I think I mentioned this. It was like, I was having a conversation, went out to dinner with my three older sons, you know? And, uh, you know, my older son, I don't know, it's his rebellion stage, whatever, but he's just, his st- the stuff he listens to is just like, ugh. And- um, What's he into? just like the worst mumble yeah rap like just like uh just you know just whatever say no more he'll grow out of that he'll grow out of it yeah yeah it almost but, has but, to well what, well what's interesting though is anyone who knows me or my family it's like and, and maybe that's part of why he's doing it because he's such the outlier because like it's in our blood you know what I mean? <laughs> like, like it's in our blood. And so, you know, the number two, he tried to fight it for a little bit, you know, wanted to get into the old man's skin, you know, like, you know, whatever. But now he's just like, oh, I don't know why he's being so dumb. Teach me about music. I'm like, great. Okay, no, let's do this, you know? But anyways, like the third one, Asher, he was just like, Asher's in it right now. Yeah, he's Asher's in it. I mean, it's just like, I look at this kid, I go like, man, that's my son. So like, I go, I can't remember. It's the one guy. I can't remember which guy it was. I think it's the guy talking about. He, he's got the weird voice like that. It was, um, I don't know, Little Dookie or something. Whatever. They all have the same kind of name, Little Dookie. <laughs> little Dookie. <laughs> like, whatever. He's, he's just, his voice is ridiculous. Whatever. Anyways, but Asher was just like, how can you listen to that? It's like, it's objectively bad music. And I was like, man, I'm so proud of you. Because Okay, yeah, he's being some bougie music snob like his dad. That's fine. But he was being, he wasn't just trying to be funny. He was just having, he was like genuinely asking his brother, like, he's like, no, like that's objectively bad. No, it's bad. It's bad, you know? So like, it's actually like, he'll, I mean, it, he's at that age, he'll he'll pull out some stuff I'm like, oh, whatever. But I'm like, okay, it's your generation. You're You're allowed to like, there has to be some of that genre, but you know what I mean? And he'll find it, whatever. But you start getting into stuff, you recognize, no, there is actually, not everything is, as not things are not subjective like people make them out to be. Because this, this proves the point. We can have this kind of like conversation between three of us and each person has their own kind of little genre and we could swap it and everyone would be like, you would, we would say respectively, that's good. Like that's a, that's objectively good. And this is one of the big things that people, this is why these, you know, this is why it's futile to try to talk anything philosophical at all with people, generally speaking, because they, they think that there's no rules. They, they think that like, if it's, if it's metaphysics, if it's philosophy, spirituality, religion, it's all, it's all subjective. Your truth is my truth. And it's like, no, no, there's, 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 there's objective truth. And it's, it's all but empirical. You can measure it. You can, you can see it, you know, but if you, if you're not in it, you don't recognize that. And it just, well, that's good for you, but it's not good for me. It's like taste. There is a measure of variance, but there is some objective facets to, to taste and to music and all these things, you know? Well, this brings up something I think kind of topical right now, and it, it maybe, and maybe this will even lead into some of the stuff that we, that we were going to talk about today. But uh, with this takeover now today, as we're recording this, Elon Musk, I guess, has officially taken over Twitter now. Uh, he's oh, offic- officially! It's officially, really? officially bought it. Yep. And uh, we've talked about Elon Musk 
uh, before in past episodes. But one of the topics that has come up because of his sort of bid for Twitter has been this idea of free speech absolutism. And I've had this weird feeling about this free speech absolutism as like, well, we should just al allow, it's important that we allow like all speech, that all speech is allowed and that all speech is like, it always seems to me that the people who say that are saying that all, anything that would be said, that there is no objective value to it, that it's That's all like at the same level, right? So we should all, that it's, there's no, there's no, possibly no speech that actually would be dangerous, mm -hmm. right? And I think, that, you know, it's the, for a materialist, it's like, it's easy to say that, but maybe it just, it, it, I'm, I'm interested in, I'm interested in this idea, like from an, an orthodox perspective, it's also something that's come up today in some of the groups that I talked to is like, this idea of how should we be looking at is clearly there is dangerous speech. What do you do with that? Like in the public square, what do we, what do we do with that as Christians? Like when it's there, is it, do we push to, to say it should be banned when we see something that's objectively like that? How do we counter it or how do, how do we encounter it maybe is better question. I mean, I think we have to qualify with like, how do we encounter it? How do we engage it in, in our context? Because fun little story um, might win me some hate mail, let's hope. Um, I was, uh, I had to, I had to kind of, my, my, my uh, one of my younger sons had gotten in trouble and, um, you know, I he had, he had I had to take him out of school, whatever. And um, in it, this is kind of one of his character traits. He's like, um, he's really into justice, you know. So, in in kind of like in the context, whatever, his mom brings up. I'm like, we're talking about what to do with them. His his um, papadia. She brings up, oh. By the way, you know, he mentioned this thing about when you um, when you disciplined him. It's one thing he like asked. He's like, Can, "Are priests allowed to, you know, like discipline their kids, like they spank their kids, whatever?" Blah blah blah. So she's like, "You know, you might want to talk to him about this." Blah blah blah. So we're going through whatever, you know, and he's doing some work on the farm, and um, I have to leave. And I go, "Hey, come here." So I pull him in the car and I showed him this video, and it's this video of these uh, protests that were happening in Georgia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I go- With the drums? I, it, it wasn't, there was a drum part in it, but it, the same one, right? But like, okay. it's, it's the one where they had to break the police lines. They're like, we're sorry, brother, we have to break, the, break your lines, but you know. Can I just say really, really quick, cause I know father, that part where the priest grabbed the police officer and just swung him around yeah. and just set him back down. Yeah. That, yeah. And like no violence, nothing, yeah. just grabbed him, swung him, set him back down. Yeah. Sorry, I'm okay, done. Okay, you guys, no, no. I'm sorry, but you guys, I just want to just make a reminder so we don't forget. I need the link to this because it's got to go in the description for people Word. to see. Okay. okay. Um, that part, especially in that video, he lost his mind on. He looked at me, he's like, priest can do that? And so this is my whole point of showing him. I was like, so check it out, son. I need to I need to scrub this idea of what you think a priest is. If you think a priest, if you think me being a priest means that like I have to sit here and just you know apologize for something that's wrong, you know, just the whole the whole thing, right? I was like, that's not a priest, you know. And so you know he, he's seeing these priests break through pre police lines. You see these priests like stand for their country for their people for god you know uh and, and and in a physical way you know it's not violence they're not you know but but it's right so the reason why i bring this up is because it that's perfectly sound especially in that context of like you know they're georgians and they're like protecting their homeland their people and they're like yeah we don't want this um corruptive, corrosive influence being promoted, right? Um, 
But in our context, because of the nature of our culture and our history and our, in our um, liberal values. And when I say liberal, I'm, I'm trying to even be you know, generous here. I don't mean liberal in the kind of like caricature pejorative sense that we've experienced in the last you know 15 years whatever but like the libs you're not talking about the libs yeah yeah in, in a more classic sense right in a more classic sense of the word so both of them exist like both approaches exist i think but we just have to give that caveat because like i'll say i have to say that because for us to respond as they would in georgia to something like some sort of toxic speech. Let's just, let's just say gender stuff, like what I, like, you know what I mean? Um, we can't respond that way. And, and not even just because again, we are in the, we are in the, the kind of like, um, we're in the belly of the beast in regards of liberalism and, and uh, liberality, all that stuff. It's not, it's not even that, but it's just the context of this culture this nation for several 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 generations is it that's not that context it does does that make sense because yes. for us it very easily snaps back into something else which is a, another that's in the world path right it snaps back into another type of uh, uh the error of the right too quickly see this is one of the things that people don't understand on both ends you get these Amer american you know, Calvinist converts who, you know, they they do have a kind of latent um, thread that of a of a kind of like disposition or a tendency towards racism. Caveat: everything and anyone who's be, who disagree who's disagreed with is labeled racist. Okay, we know that. Fine, let's move on. So, anyways. But like, it actually exists, right? And so, um, or they, or at least that tendency, right? Um, and so, what happens is, is that those people they can really misunderstand certain things because they don't have a context of of that culture. You know, I mean, this is that um, you know, um, Brother Augustine. That's how my how how him and I started talking was like we're able to kind of understand that and a lot of people, they just don't get that. They, anybody sees something that smacks of any, any type of traditional perspective on culture or ethnicity, or whatever for them in the wet, you know, and rightly so because of errors, it just smacks of just like Nazism and all that stuff, whatever. And, 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 uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a reason for that. You have to watch, you have to watch the, the moving to the extremes, right? So that's that's kind of one of the reasons why um, the, the question for us, like how would we respond? I have to say a right response for us wouldn't be the same as a right response for, for Georgians or for Russians or for Romanians or for, you know, Ugandans or whoever, you, you know what I'm saying? Because there's a cultural co cohesion in, and, there's um, a homogenous aspect, which isn't bad, to those cultures, which is different than the than the kind of plurality that we experience here. Um, and so, some people will go as far as say, "Well, that's the problem, it's pluralism." And like the person who says that's the problem, they're the ones who I'm warning about because <laughs> you, 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 do you see what I'm saying? Um, I know we just yes, went to a can of worms. Yes, I do. We Captain just, America, Captain America probably wouldn't let Red Skull give a speech. That's all I'm right. gonna say. Yeah, Captain America jump up and be like, no more. Like, yeah, but but would he stop something that he just found? Yeah, Red Skull, no. Okay. But there's a lot of levels before Red Skull. Yeah. Yeah. I you mean, know, like this, that's this, the question. See, this is what's interesting to me because one of the things which we haven't talked about this type of thing for a while is um it's been a while since I've sat back to really kind of assess where we're at, but I think that um, some of these things, some of the nuance, it, 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 I don't know, like, I don't know where we're at. Because let me give you an example I'm talking about. Like, 
I'll just go out there, right? Let's have a controversial episode, right? If it's even possible. Like, like Antifa, right? So I was thinking about this not too long ago because, uh, you know, we had this on a couple episodes back, we're talking about that documentary I watched on the, on the, um, the Baldies and the non-racist skinhead movement, blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, it's all context, right? Because now like Antifa has become this, it, it's it's become associated with just all this other like all this stuff, right? Whatever. Um, extremism, communism, like like all the stuff, right? Just all all the, all the stuff that's kind of repugnant and, and pastiche, like whatever. But what people don't understand on that end is that some of that is you know so much of that was birthed out of legitimate issues, and like you don't really know that unless like I can tell someone's like. So it's like, ah, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, in the 90s, when I was kind of like, that, that was a real thing. Like, like it, it was a real thing. And it wasn't all due to Geraldo having, you know, Nazi skinheads on TV. Like, on the streets, it was, it was a real thing. So it becomes easy now because people are so just mad at the spectacle of wokeism they're so mad at the spectacle of what's of all the the distortions of wokeism right the victim the victim mentality you know the the kind of ex, the, the extreme this is the absurdity but the fact of the matter is like there was a there was a seed there that was true that kind of birthed that just like just like yeah. if we talk about the extreme to the right you know there's there's a legitimate seed there that that gives birth to conservative you know right-wing movements there's, there's always some sort of seed there but, but you can't call every like recently father sorry to interrupt but it's like i think to the right the how lately and it's been crazy and it's become like a meme where they're just calling everybody everybody i don't like is a groomer and uh -huh. i think like you know they fell into it with this whole disney thing and all of this and it's like everybody I don't like is a groomer. And it's like, well, you know, mm -hmm. no, it's yeah. not like, but there are legitimate like groomers out there. Like it's a terrible thing. But the second that everybody becomes a groomer, okay. well, then you can't even deal with the actual problem. Hey, you know what I mean? Hey. Yeah. Okay, groomer. Is that a thing yet? Oh, man. Is that a thing yet? I hope not. Let's not make it a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not let it start. But yet. it's interesting to me because I've come to this place where, like, I've really been, you know, it's like there's some memes are pretty incredible. And I don't just mean, like, for the ha-ha factor, like, whatever, like, low-level, like, knuckle-dragging, you know, crotch-scratching, like, bong-ripping humor. Like, that stuff is, like, that's stupid. But, like, memes are pretty as a medium as a phenomena it's brilliant it, it's it's super high level it's semiotics right so the 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 kind of downside of that though is it produces a really kind of grotesque polemical disposition does that make sense what i'm saying you know absolutely um, yeah and so it's just one of those things where it's like people don't have the means to discern and filter these things out and what happens is is like you know people you know you can have conversations with people of like mine but the fact of the matter is the culture on the whole is so obtuse and in, is in such a place of like of de-evolution it's just like all you can do is, you know, to some degree, um, kind of man, you know, build the wall, you know, pull a Nehemiah, build the wall and try and just try to maintain your, your stamp of community, build your arc, you know, and, and really hold as pray that it holds as best it can against the, the tides of barbarism, because that that's, I mean, the barbarism to me, that's what, that's what that is. And, and, it is, in fact, in fact, um, you know, whether they be, <laughs> you know, um, Visigoths or whether they be, you know, uh, you know, uh, Carthaginian. Oh, like, yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, 
there's barbarism all around. There's there's barbarism all around. So, hey, Father, uh, I'm sorry, Cyprian. I'm going to veer us completely off. Do topic. it, please. Do it. Veer. Hmm. veer us. So, hey, all that stuff is really interesting, guys. But here's something else. <laughs> Speaking of culturally and the uh, Christian. Speaking of Christian culture, uh, this is what I wanted to do this episode. And I, I am kind of slamming. I'm the driver's ed teacher that's slamming on the brakes and grabbing the wheel and saying, we're going to go over do here it. now. Do it. Because, it's probably more related than you think. No, it is 100%. Because I was talking with someone today who is a member of the Orthodox Church um, who said that we are kind of, kind of like rattling off some of the cultural like I, I i'm reluctant to say do's and don'ts of the church um but really i think maybe it's more along the lines of etiquette so um i was talking to father yesterday and we were talking about doing a question and answer but i think i i had thrown out the idea of doing like an etiquette episode just like some basic mistakes that you can make in an orthodox church or whatever without even realizing it. And I think um, it does relate because it's a culture one. So these are, you know, this is just like a little, I, I don't, I don't know the correct phrase to use here, but it's like a little, I just wish someone had told me this kind of stuff. I, I, I this would be gr this. I am looking forward to this. Actually. It's like, this will be great for me. It's very difficult to get catechized in America properly. I'll say that. To like, because I didn't grow up with orthodoxy, I'm very much father, father said, and I wholeheartedly agree, as an American convert, I am always a guest within the orthodox church. I never like can come, I mean, it is my home, but I should think of myself as a guest. I'm essentially coming into a mansion. I've been invited to a castle or whatever. The castle is 2000 years old. People have been living in this castle for 2000 years. I'm been in it for eight years, you know, so I'm still kind of, and I'm the guy that's like not taking off his shoes in the right room. I'm still like eating the decorative soaps because I don't realize they're not food. And like, I'm using the his and her towels and not using the guest towels and stuff. I just don't know. So I think that there's, and I'm going to let father do the rest of the connective tissue here of why what we're talking about is related but I was thought I could rattle off a couple things, not not a huge deal, um, about common things about Orthodox culture that I don't think Americans. So I asked a couple people, and they these were their questions. So um, I thought I could ask Father, and then he could like expound on that a little bit more. So the one. So what's the um, what's an important one? What's the one I want to start with? Okay, Father, why should you not prostrate after taking communion? So you shouldn't prostrate after taking communion because um, you've received the the body and blood of Christ, and you've received it in in the light of the participation of the Holy Liturgy, which is, um, you know, ultimately a proclamation of his of his death, burial, and resurrection. So once you've taken Holy Communion, it's, it's um, a celebration it's a, of, of his victory. It's an awareness of his victory. And so um, there's two things. There's a penitential nature that's inherent to prostrations. Um, it's the same reason why we don't, um, prost we don't make prostrations now in Bright Week and we don't make any prostrations or kneeling until Pentecost because we're in the Paschal season, we are uh, putting forward the victory and the realization of the resurrectional life, right? And so we don't read the Psalter. We don't, um, we don't read the Psalter the first week. Um, we don't prostrate because um, in reading the Psalter, um, all the prophecies are fulfilled. All the prophecies in the, in the Psalter have been fulfilled and, and we are experiencing the resurrection, you know, the, the, the resurrectional life now. Right. Mm. And so um, the bridegroom has come to us in that sense. Right. And so um, so that is why we don't prostrate. And no, heaven, no heavenly king. Right. No comforter. Yeah, correct. No heavenly king. And that is to um, 
also make us aware of the absence or not the absence, the Holy Spirit is not absent from us, but um, our need, if you can understand the distinction, it's, it's to, inf to uh, bring forward our need of the Holy Spirit. Does that I make apologize. sense? I apologize. I'm sorry. At the beginning of our prayers, it is, it is traditional, it's normal for us to say, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, glory to thee, our God, glory to thee, O heavenly King, O comforter, that's how uh, and the spirit of truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, treasure of blessings and giver of life, come to abide in us and cleanse us from every stain and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Well, that's I wasn't it. trying to say the whole thing because we're not supposed to, Father. <laughs> <I'm> just, uh, <laughs> well, God bless you. But but that that is addressed to the Trinity, yes, but that that is in particular addressed to the Holy Spirit, just to give people the context who don't know that. So so in place of that, we we sing. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's that way till Pentecost. Correct. Okay. I know the only reason I know this stuff is because Father sent out an email earlier this week. So I'm, I'm, I'm like right up on it. So, um, so then I'm just going to go back to my list. Great. Real quick. Um, head coverings for women. And what is an appropriate head covering? Because I've seen some head coverings that don't feel like head coverings to me, like maybe like a like a sun hat or something like that. I don't know. Like I, maybe that's just me being judgmental. Let's not write that off. But it's just like uh, I don't know. It seems like it's skirting the law or skirting the letter of the law a little bit. Yeah, you know, um, I, you know, we were, we were mentioning this uh, yesterday, right? But the first thing I want to say about etiquette is um, when in Rome you know, within reason, within reason, right? But just kind of like when in Rome is a good thing to kind of like keep in mind because one of the things that drives people crazy is that there isn't some sort of like uniform thing because it not only does it go from church to church, what I mean by church to church, I mean, you know, here in the States, unfortunately, uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, meaning, or, you know, OCA, Serbian, Rocor, you know, GOA, whatever. Um, not only does it not only does it vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but it, it varies from parish to parish, right? So there's just there, there is a which I which I appreciate actually. There's there's a there's a greater variance than people might acknowledge to some degree, um, and there's greater variance. Some jurisdictions and churches will have greater variance than others, but when in Rome, for the most part, now. More like being, when in Constantinople. <laughs> hey, that's right. when in Constantinople, my friend. So um, that being said, that being said, there's certain things that, um, like for instance, I would tell any of my spiritual daughters, right? Just like, yeah, you go to a church or whatever, you wear your head covered. You know what I mean? Like you don't. It's not one of those things where it's like, well, no one here is wearing them, so I'm not going to. No, you wear yours, right? Because that, because your piety should supersede to some degree whatever is going on there now that also deeply applies in regards of if there are certain things like your piety is to you know i don't know like i'm not saying i'm just giving an example like you go somewhere and your piety is in, in the appropriate times to like prostrate whatever but you walk into a parish like no one's prostrating when they walk into the icons don't i would say probably don't prostrate because at that point, it's it might become more of a spectacle and draw attention than than what you're intending. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the head covering is a different type of thing, and mm -hmm. the, the reason, right? So, so the head covering, I would, you know, um, you know, this the, Saint Paul talks about, you know, a woman, you know, have her head covered for the uh, for the angels. Um, and, you know, I would say that people should understand, you know, in the church, we, the head covering is a, is a symbol of the value of women. It's a symbol of the, the absolute holding up of femininity that the church does. Mm -hmm. um, we, if you look in the church, we put veils over things that are precious right? The holy gifts are, they have veils over them, right? 
um, the altar when it's consecrated has a has a has a has a, a veil over it, um, and so so we we veil things that are that are precious and um, the modesty that is um, on on a, a spiritual modesty that is that is the woman's offering is is of the utmost you know it's precious and i've also said to people you know a woman should wear that covering the same reason why you know i should be wearing a cassock like you want me showing up to do the liturgy in hawaiian shorts and a and a you know <laughs> lacrosse I mean, long sleeve okay. shirts for what for men right yeah yeah you know generally speaking generally speaking um no shorts you know, generally speaking, of course it varies, you know, like you really, sh definitely you shouldn't be wearing shorts in liturgy. You know, you might be able to get away with it, hot, depending where you're at, you know, if you're in a tropical place, Vespers, whatever, it, it all depends. But for liturgy, you should be wearing pants, you know. Um, and it, of course it gets more so if you're at a monastery, um, definitely you should be wearing long sleeve shirts, long sleeve pants, women should be wearing dresses head coverings, you know, and it's all, it's all modesty and it's all putting forward um, the spirituality, which is not, um, it's not excluded from our, our, our uh, physicality, right? But, but these things um, are physical bodies the material aspect of our of ourself is how we express our our worship mm. right but the source of the worship is spiritual but it's expressed materially right so it's both does that answer the head covering question or i believe so i think so and from like a practical and okay i was gonna say this because this is weighing on me when i first became orthodox uh i was at a parish uh, a little um a little mission and they were struggling with these same things um people were kind of you know so they were kind of looking for this more like uniform and a strict sense of like like a like a hit brochure or something that they can maybe give people mm -hmm. and um they found one at a greek church and uh they brought it over my priest who at the my, my the priest who baptized me i love this man to death he took it back into his altar or into the altar and uh, was sitting there just brow furrowed, just reading it back and forth. And he came up and he gave it to this person and said, you know, get this trash out of here. Like, I don't want this in my church. Like, cause it was like a rules of do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I kind of want to say, I'm asking this because once you start getting into the spirit of the church, when you start getting into the rhythm of church, there are things that start to not feel right anymore about doing one of the things that I noticed was that when I would sit cross-legged in church, maybe particularly if I were sitting with my feet, the bottom of my feet pointed towards the altar, it just didn't feel right to me anymore. So what I'm trying to do is that I think that there is a reason for that. And not because I, Andrew Funk, a layman, you know, a, a only really becoming Orthodox, capital O in the, in the last like two years, I'm not laying down like, well, this is what you guys should be doing. I'm just saying that there are things that like are, you might regret one day, you know, you might regret having done, you know, having done that because, you know, it, it might just show that. So then this is the last example. Like if I wrote a priest, a priest monk, um, and he basically tore me up, he, he, in a loving way, tore me up because I wrote to him, I did not write to him in a way that was proper. Like I wrote an email to him that was not proper for, um, to, to write to like a clergyman. Yeah. And he, he wasn't mean. He wasn't yeah. like, but he was like, this is, you are absolutely doing this incorrectly. Like in yeah. the fact that you're doing this incorrectly says that there's something wrong with you spiritually, not you, this needs to be the rest of your week. You don't need to beat yourself up. But the fact that you're talking to me in the manner that you're talking to me, means that something is wrong with you spiritually and i am far too um what's the what breeds contempt familiar i'm I, i'm oftentimes far too familiar with father turbo in, in a way that i still understand it 
but I have to understand that like my familiarity with the priest, especially with a priest, I don't talk to you very often does indicate something's up with my spiritual life. Does it mean, do you, do you feel comfortable giving like a little more detail into this exchange so that, so oh. that I and other people listening can get an idea of like, well, what is an, what, what is an appropriate, and you don't have to be specific on this okay, thing, but if I you would could be general, I mean, that would be helpful. I would sit here and read the email. Exchange I don't think you need to read the email it. exchange, but, but I mean, I mean, just, I'm just saying I would, you know, okay, just, okay. if you guys wanted that, I would, but no, I'm, <laughs> that's how comfortable I am talking with this because I just said, father bless. And then I started talking about what was going on and father bless is the bare minimum of like, from what I understand of father, please jump in at any time. If I'm saying anything incorrectly, um, but basically the proper protocol at least according to this priest, this priest monk, um, was Father Bless. And then I would say, Father, please have, um, may I have your blessing for me and my family. Name everybody in your family, their saint name, not just my family. He corrected, said there's power in saying a name. So he doesn't also, so he doesn't have to go through and find my family's names later on. So every time I talk to him, please pray for my family, Markella, Zenya. Nikolai and the unborn Matrona, the un unborn child Matrona. Um, also, if you could play, pray for da, 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 subject of email below that, you know, Father, I'm just writing to let you know that I got those books you talked to me about and they're really good. I just wanted to bring up these particular parts, blah, blah, blah. Then at the end, Father, if I can have you continue to pray for St. Mary's Orthodox Church maybe some other folks that you want him to pray for names specifically names. And if they're in the church indicate as such and use their saint names. And then in Christ, Andrew at the bottom, I didn't do any of that stuff. I just said, father bless. Well, how are you doing father? How's, how's, you know, how's the Southern hemisphere treating you type of thing. Like, and he wasn't mean, but he did basically like what you're doing is really inappropriate right now. Like, like, basically, you're not addressing me in the, with the respect that the office of the priesthood holds. It's the same reason why I talked about it, why, like, my daughter was messing around and then a nun told her to knock it off. It's like, it doesn't matter, although we love that nun. It doesn't matter who the nun is. A nun tells you to do something. Within reason, you do it because you're respecting the office of, like, of a monastic. So there's that there's that and it was the idea here that this is a priest that you are not that you don't talk to often that you're because that seems like that i i don't that would somehow seem wrong to me if i was every time i communicated with father turbo that i was communicating in that way that would seem should i be communicating in that way with you father turbo every single time so um this this is tough but it's also really informative it's good I deal with this a lot in regards of, um, <laughs> there's there's a lot of people who uh, they, I'll, I'll answer your question directly, but this is really good because there's a lot of people who, um, there's, just, there's just the spectrum, right? There's, there's, there's the spectrum. It's just like, it's, this, is the, this is the reality of piety. There's a spectrum. And there's people who I correct them and I correct them to where they're at. There's some people I don't even bring it up because um, at this point or at that point, I choose not to bring it up to them because I'm like, it will, um, it will, the potential to discourage them at that point, And I don't have the type of relationship with them that they'll receive the correction properly. So I don't, and that, you know, that's a thing. But what, what the higher monk is speaking about is, you know, orthodoxy is maximalism, right? It's maximalism. So it's like, yes, that's all, that's all good. And yes, Andrew's correct. Father Bless is kind of like the bare minimum. Um, but I, I, here's the other thing you have to understand. There's a difference between addressing a bishop 
and addressing your parish priest, your confessor. I think that there's there's just there's a variance there, and there's a variance in regards of, um, like, you know, the nuns. The I expect more from the nuns than I obviously do from you know, other lay women here. You, you, you see what I'm saying? But there may be some lay women who makes who may be maximal. See, you understand what I'm saying? The problem is, is here's one of the big things is no matter where we're going with this, we have to we have to avoid rigidity in the sense that rigidity for the sake of something outside of love. Right. And and this is this is really key because people can can really miss the forest for the trees sometimes in, in this regard, you know? So I'm by no means, I, I, I would like to believe that what I'm saying is, is complimentary to what was offered by the, by the higher monk, you know what I mean? Um, but I would say in regards of addressing a priest for sure, Father Bless, um, and then your name, and then the subject, like, is, is, is appropriate and bare minimum, you know? Um, I will say this, and, and, you know, I imagine Hiram Monk would probably say, well, that's, that's the problem with some of these priests, which he wouldn't be wrong. But there's some priests who, if you addressed all that to them, they'd be like, like, whoa, that's too much. You know what I mean? They, they, would, they would be like, Oh, who's this? You know, does it make a difference because he's a priest monk? Does that make a difference? So it makes a difference because he's a priest monk, a higher monk. It makes a difference because of your relation to him, I imagine, as well. You know what I mean? Like, I personally find it, it's there, there is a measure of, um, There, there's there's a there's a there's a there's a glaring lack of etiquette, respect, and awareness of of the office of the priesthood that come. I mean, I see, I run into it all the time. Um, but I don't take it personal because I I I know that like that's that's one of the big things is I don't take it personal. It's never like how dare you disrespect me, you know. Um, but you run into it and the and just we we are we are barbarians, <laughs> right? It's a game back to barbarians. We're barbarians, so. For me, I'm really keen on, I'm trying to convert people. I'm, tr I'm, trying to, I'm trying to bring people out of barbarism. That's how I see it, you know what I mean? Um, and most people would look at me and think I'm a barbarian myself anyways, and they're, they are correct, right? So yeah, um, but I would just say to this, if some like those who are listening, if if you're falling into anxiety of like, oh my gosh, you know, blah blah blah, don't do that. Don't fall into anxiety. Amen. But just look at the situation in regards of when you are dealing with when you're writing any type of clergy, any monastic, especially if you're writing a bishop or a hierarch, you really need to understand that like, how would you address I wouldn't even say Christ. How would you address, you know, an official, a king? Like, how how would you do that, right? Because right, this is so backwards. It's so backwards, and this is part of the thing with etiquette that we hope we can get into this a little bit. Like, part of the barbarism that people are suffering from is the barbarism of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. That they they do not see Christ as deserving of this type of fear and respect jesus is their homeboy jesus is their kind of like whatever you know and so because of that there's a familiarity that is really contempt that they offer to christ they would never say it they'll say like no i love it's blah 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 but it, it, it's it, it that's what it is it, it it's, it's barbaric in that sense so so i would just say like you get out of your piety and your etiquette, your etiquette, your piety, you get out of it what you put into it. So if you put into it, if you put into it rigidity for the sake of wanting to be like 
the guy who has his eyes dotted and his T's crossed, then what you're going to get out of that is, is something that, that won't be very life-giving. If, if that makes sense, right? That's, that's yeah. the other side of it. That's I think that's, that's, that's what I was trying to say with my caveat just a, a minute ago or whatever. I was trying to say, this is not rigidity for rigidity's sake. It is life-giving. Mm-hmm. It's like it's living, I guess, more correctly or being more pious. So, yeah. So, like to be to be a God fearer, a God honorer. You know, piety is the means by which Saint Theophanes. If you don't have love, do acts of love. Right. If you don't have faith, if you don't have connection, God feels distance. All those things. Well, then. I would say most people I run into that, not all, but a lot of people are like, well, I would, I would, I would want to look at their piety. I, I would want to look at like, how are, the, how are they around holy things, right? Because there's a direct correlation to your piety, to your, your honor and fearing of God and, and of, of holy things to your, the warmth of your heart. There's a direct correlation there, right? A person who treats holy things with a, a kind of casualness and, and, and to some degree like a familiarity that, that really borders on indifference, that person spiritually tends to be, you know, very, you know, lukewarm and dead. I'm sorry. That's just, it's, it's not an absolute. It's, you know, I'm not saying there's always exceptions, whatever, but that tends to be the thing. Now, the other side of this, though, too, is that there are people who, I've spent a lot of time getting people out of rigidity and into an actual living, an actual relationship with a living, breathing God. And that, that's a little bit different too, because the thing about rigidity and the thing about Pharisaism is that it's devoid of love. And, and, and it is often, it, it's, excuse me, it's often devoid of love and always the it's it's always um um emanating vanity because there's there's self a self aggrandizing something yes there's 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 an there's an external an external aspect to it but again here's here's the thing it's tough for us as americans because we're such glad handers and we are barbarians um we look at that and we just think that anything that anything that is actually pious and accurate is nothing but just that. It's all vanity and it's all like, well, God doesn't like that anyway. Jesus wants to sit down, have a beer with me and kick up his heels. It's like, no, you don't know. You don't know. The king of all creation we're talking about. Yeah. So, so it's it to kind of round this out if we want, we can keep going, but This is an unsatisfactory, this is an unsatisfying answer, but it's, it's a correct one. It really, it depends on the person. What I mean is where they're at at that moment. Because um, let's just be really clear. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of people who have been Orthodox their whole life and they're not pious. That it's, it's not like, it's not baked into the cradle in that sense. There's some things that are, there's some things that are, right, in regards of, you know, um, knowing the kind of like rudimentary aspects of the culture of the church, but um, piety has more to do with one's own personal fervor versus versus like the actual exact movements and speed of this may they make the cross. Does that that make sense? I think it's really important to say that because You know, so many people, we all go through, we want to find out, I want to do everything right. I want to do everything right, which is, that's a good sentiment, right? But I always have to check it because it's just, there are these moments where it's better that you learn the humility of engaging something necessarily, engaging something not necessarily in an improper sense, but maybe in a naive sense, so that your ability then 
to really become orthodox becomes more apparent. And what I mean by that is this, you can teach a monkey how to do things accurately, right? But to actually come to a place where you're moving in your heart, that, that's, that's, that's not as easy and that takes experience and it takes maturity. See, because people want to come in and they just, they want to learn all the right bows, all the right secret handshakes, but the seasoning in which that becomes an, like an actually integrated part of their, of their personhood, it doesn't happen that quick, right? And so this is just part of those, this is part of one of the things where, um, and you know, I, I would just say the fruit of this is like, and again, it's all context, right? If someone hasn't had a lot of experience working with converts and Americans, and especially in my little kind of specialty, um, American converts who are coming out of a, particular, a, a particularly rough and difficult context, whether it's subculture and all the kind of accoutrement of that, drugs and violence and all, you know what I mean? All that to some degree or another, um, it, it becomes a different conversation, right? Because we're not talking about like upper middle class Anglicans who, you know what I mean? Want it like, we're, like I'm dealing with people as you guys know, like uh, who have come from really rough spots and, and the fact that they, the fact that they, I look at some people, I go like the fact that they're even in church the fact that they're even making the sign of the cross, the fact that they're even trying to trust God with their life, to me, that's everything. And, and it's more important that I'm able to approach them at a time when I feel God's blessing that, meaning that a broken, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering flax he will not snuff out, as the scripture says. You, you, you can't just come in there and be like, Nope, you're doing everything wrong, you're doing everything wrong. This actually just happened recently where someone in the parish corrected a new person about prostrations and it's just kind of like, it's in my mind, I'm like, I'm gonna have to correct this person when I get the chance, right? For, for correcting this other person because they should he should not have corrected him. Yeah. It, it was the wrong spirit. And there's a time and a place to correct people. I mean, you know, Andrew, I correct, I correct people all the time. Mm -hmm. But with God's help, I try to do it in a way that's going to encourage them and not discourage them. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the key. It's so, like when you got that vinyl or whatever, that record, and someone gave it to you and you're like, I can't take this. You know what I'm talking about, Father? Yeah, yeah. it's like a way of bringing you guys closer together. And it has. I mean, it, it, and I would like to think what I'm saying, well, what I'm saying here is, is, is from experience, right? Like. It just is. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Like, like you just, it's just from experience. Like sure. the parish is filled, filled with people. Like it, it's, sure. it's all, it's all experience. Right. And we all, yeah. Anyways. So then this is a, this is one that was interesting because this is one of those good moments of being like, okay, it's nice to know that I always know, but to then like have this like emotional, I guess, satisfaction that God is still working in me that no one told me this. It just started to feel wrong to do it. And that was um, when you enter an Orthodox church, um, there's icons you venerate. Usually they're towards the front of the church, but not always. Mm -hmm. um, and there are times in which during the liturgy, during Vespers and stuff that the royal doors are mm -hmm. open. And it just at a certain point, it started to feel kind of wrong to go up and venerate those icons when the royal doors were open. And so um, I started to feel wrong. And then one day, it was, I think it was a Sunday, Father, because of the liturgy, you know, it was for that part of the liturgy, closed the doors. And then like three or four people went up and then venerated who had been standing there for a little while. And I was like, okay, this must be a thing. And then I asked Father about it. And he was like, well, you know, in his father way of trying to be you know, um, not necessarily, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, political, maybe it's the word I'm looking for, but um, diplomatic, Diplomatic. trying to be diplomatic because we're sitting at a table and maybe he did like a quick ocular scan of like who was sitting at the table. 
but he was like, well, you know, yeah, there might be some important stuff going on or there is some important stuff going on and maybe you shouldn't be up there at that time. So, um, uh, yeah, I wanted to, that, that is like a thing though, right. To like maybe wait till the Royal doors are closed as best as you can to go up and venerate those icons at the front. Yeah. 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 And yes. And, and you, and then just understand there's like everything in the church, everything in reality is, is hierarchical, right? So there's a hierarchy of, of, um, you know, especially if the chalice is out, the chalice is out, you know, chalice is out, always stand up. Don't sit down. Don't sit down, you know, don't sit down until the chalice is, is brought back into the altar. You know, Christ is, Christ is there. Um, (laughs) Christ is, you know, being, is there present with us bloodily and, and, it's, it's I'll give you another good one people should know if you're somewhere and there's a bishop there or bishops don't get the blessing from the priest you know it was on my list it was on my list yeah. like especially like now if you need to if you know you're catching your you know your spiritual father and no one's around just like hey, man, you know love your father you bless, like okay whatever you know that's that's that kind of like piety that's endearing right that's the familiarity that's endearing right um but you know, we don't do that because um, hierarchically the bishop, you know, the priest serves by the authority and the blessing of the bishop, right? And so the bishop, you know, we don't, priests don't offer blessings. We don't give blessings in because, you know, truly Christ, you know, in, in the person of the bishop is, is there, right? So, yeah. Just, in, just as an example, you know, that kind of yeah. hierarchy, that hierarchy of, of of, of veneration and worship then during like the gospel and your homily or the homily rather uh-huh. um people sh- probably shouldn't be like going in and out of the church uh, yeah. out of the nave as best as they can obviously yes. kids throwing a fit you know yeah. so if you if your job is you know doing you know th- there's a great rule of three i just want to encourage people to understand uh you know, first bless, second bless, third one's from the devil. You know, first glass of wine, bless, second glass of wine, third one's from the devil. First peep from the kid, God bless them, we're glad they're alive. Second peep from the kid, you know, it's joy, it's a symbol of life. Third peep and on, it's like, you know, okay. It, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's just understanding that. And the reason I say that is because getting up and taking your child out of the service during the homily or the gospel reading after the third going on until the fourth, Kind of like, and I have eight children, so I understand it. But like, there's a difference between like the like nah, like the just the kind of one offer versus the extended like. Nah. It's like once we start getting into metalcore, and it's just like <laughs> I'm waiting just for the blast beats to come in. Take the kid outside, you know, like it's okay um, because mothers and fathers, you pray with your feet churching your child you know is part of it like that's part of the trade-off like traditional parishes we don't do cry rooms because the children should be in the liturgy and that's how we church them but at the same time part of churching them is is training them to understand that if they get taken out of the service that like something's wrong you know and so we want to train them to want to be in there anyways so um but i say all that because the reading of the gospel especially more way more than the homily especially my homily is much more important to not have any movement so for instance good practice you come to church you're in the narthex whatever you're you're like oh we've been late the kids you know they were flinging you know whatever in the car we're we're here late you're about to grab the door and you see that you know father or the priest or you know the deacon or whoever is about to read the gospel don't open the door like, you know, or, or more importantly, is reading the gospel, wait in the narthex before you come in. That's that's good piety, actually, right? Um, definitely, the, definitely the gospel. Like, the, the gospel is a time where stand up for the gospel, right? Always stand up for the gospel. Always, like, either do not, stay, either stay in or get out. One of the two, if you're like, if you need to go, make sure you go before, but don't, no ins and outs during the gospel, right? Because... Christ 
right, is <laughs> the gospel is, is, is the icon of Christ, and that is the word that is being that delivered for the day. That's, that is the word you're going to consume and eat, right, mm-hmm. is, is that gospel for the day. Another thing is, too, is when, like, when is it okay for me to receive communion or not, whatever? Well, if, if you come in past the gospel, you really shouldn't receive communion unless it's already been arranged with Father and you have that blessing. Just, just plan on that. Like, if I'm late, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I come in after the gospel, I'm not talking like the first, you, know, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, sure. if you're coming in after the gospel, just plan on not receiving. And that's okay. Like, if you know better. Like yeah, if you know, yeah, if you know better, right? If you know better, then, then, then if you know better, then do better. And I think that's another thing about piety. If you know better, do better. Um, and we all learn and grow. And that isn't just for converts. That's for everybody. That, that's, that's for everybody, you know? Um, um, should you kiss somewhere specific on an icon when you're venerating? Yeah, you know, um, I tend to try to go for the feet. Um, that's just me. Some people be like, no, this is all getting in the hogwash, whatever. But again, there's just some common sense aspects to it. You know, um, I try to go for the feet, try to go for the hand, you know, um, common sense, you know, and because it's a blessing, right? Like maybe like the right hand. Okay. Yeah. Cyprian, do you have any questions? I got a couple more, but I don't want to just keep you. These silent. are all questions. No, these are all questions that I had. So keep going because okay. you definitely nailed them. You're nailing okay. them. That was actually a question I've always had. So a lot of these are not mine, just so we're clear. Like a lot of these I asked Orthodox people. I was like, hey, they're great. What yeah. what would you like to know? Oh, these are these are great. You've you've crowdsourced out some key ones, definitely, that I've had. I've certainly had all of these questions. So Father, um, when you are going around the edge of the church, I think blessing the icons, right, with the censor during Vespers. Mm-hmm. Um, when you, I know this is small, but this is one of the first ones I asked you actually. Stay forward or move? What's that? Like keep, walk, keep looking forward or follow me? Is that the question? Fo- follow you, but when you go out, do I know this is kind of dumb. But when you go out, do I turn my back to you or to the altar to turn around, to turn me. your back to Father? Okay, yeah. yeah. So just so we're clear, Father like, goes. Like around. I'll put you like this. I'll put you like this. The, with sensing, most people do this. They f- like they follow whatever. Um. Oh wait, you shouldn't do that. Uh, you know. Forward. You know. Here's the thing. Um, when in Rome, whatever, most people follow, but like, <laughs> I don't do that. Like if I'm, you know, so, so basically you may explain, if I explain to you what's happening during a sensing, I think it'll make sense for people because I've had some people in the past be like, oh, I was kind of offended. I feel like you weren't sensing me. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm not sensing you during that point. Like, so when the when the dirt, the deacon or the priest is coming down, they will, and the, and there's some, there are some variants. There's variants, right? So this isn't dogma, but typically the priest is coming and sensing the icons first, right? He goes down this, uh, goes down the south wall, and then up the north, comes back up, senses he's sensing the icons in the in the, in the nave and in, in the narthex. But then they will turn and begin to sense the people. So you sense the icons and then you sense the other icons, right? So, so does that make sense? So, so, yeah. so you're, so the people are being sensed when I'm on the ambo sensing them. That's when people are bowing, whatever, right? So in other words, if I'm going down the north and coming up this or going down the south, coming up the north, if someone's facing facing straight looking at the altar still that's that's correct and accurate okay if they if they turn to face me whenever you know that's okay but that's fine i'm gonna make a thing about it but definitely like you don't want to uh you know by the time i'm you know in just turn your back to me not towards the altar at that point because 
I, I'm out there sensing the icons. And then if you're following father during a, a during um, there comes a point which you either turn your back to the altar to do a 360 or um, you turn your back to father to come around the other way. This is what I'm at. Yeah, this is what I'm asking. And again, it seems trite, it seems small, but it was something that was life-giving once I asked Father. And you better believe I've been following Father. Um, and but you better believe that every time I turn my back towards Father rather than the altar, that question, that question and that interaction between Father and I comes to my my brain or my mind, rather. And I'm just like, okay. Because again, that's confirmation that something is working on me because it was something that felt incorrect. And then lo and behold, there it because it's we're orthodox, it's correct worship, it's worshiping correctly. And so, you know, you can say, well, it seems a little bit legalistic and stuff like that. But again, like I would feel weird propped up in a lazy chair if President Joe Biden walked in the room. And I don't even like that guy. Like, I don't even have respect for that guy. So, like, if President Joe Biden Good point, walked, that's a great point. Yeah, if he walked into a room, I would, I'm not saying I would get up and like salute him, but I would feel weird about in back in my lazy chair with like my spin drift tea or whatever, just like hanging out, you know, like I, I would feel weird about that, let alone like the, the person I'm actually wanting to worship, the one I'm actually wanting to fall down before. So that, that's, that gets, I that, think that gets us into thinking about that barbarism and, and the kind of particular flavor that Americans have. You know about like pfft, whatever, but but it's like you know. Don't you want to be a human being who has dignity and honor, right? And dignity and honor that transcends your own kind of personal proclivities. So, in other words, to be able to honor the office of the president, right? And even more so, it it. it gets to the point when there's a president who you don't respect on a personal level it, it more than trying to be like Shh, you're not worth it it's it's rather like i'm not going to lower myself right uh i'll even go one step further and be like our lord taught us to love our enemies do you, you understand what i'm saying and timothy says you know i command that saint paul says a command that um, prayers and sacrifice be, be be made for um some authorities. That's why we have litanies, you know? And so it, it's just the church calls us to, to be human beings. And the problem is we aren't human enough. The problem is, is that our bar for being human is so low and it's, it's barbaric. And so we are always wanting to, to ascend and to grow and, and to become more, more and more human. I mean, I know a priest I personally disagree with on a big issue with, but you better believe every time I see that man, I ask for a blessing. And like, I, you know, I still treat him with respect. Like there's absolutely no, it, it would be for me, Andrew Funk, a layman from Missouri, for me to walk up and start arguing with him. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Like that, there's just nothing to that because he's in the office of the priesthood. And, and he'll you'll have find, to word. And you'll find some people I've encountered this before. Uh, I've encountered this with some people who they've gotten too big for their britches and maybe they have spent some time overseas and they start telling me like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Well, the Russians, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, ah, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm talking about is some people will take something that's a bad practice and say, just because Russians do it, that it's the right way. Like for instance, coming late well that's the russian way of doing it no it's not <laughs> i mean it is maybe but that's just a bad habit sure. you, you know what i'm saying like there there are these things that it there's things where that's a great example of like i don't really like okay sure great is that honoring god is, is it honoring god to come late to liturgy right before communion i don't care how long it's been done no it's not you know what I mean? So it's like, there are these things here where this is what I mean by like my spiritual daughters. It's like, no, you wear your head covering daughter. You do that because you're doing it to honor God and the angels. You know what I'm saying? You're not doing it to prove to anyone that you are like an, a 100% correct Orthodox convert. Like who cares about that? Right? Like this, this just, 
it's it's important that we kind of understand that. And it's one of the things, it's one of the tougher things about becoming Orthodox is that you, there, there's just a royal, there's a middle road, there's a royal path that you have to really kind of like walk. <laughs> and it requires actual engagement because if you just want to go on the internet and read some stuff and not get to what, not get to where we're trying to talk about, which is the heart, like you're gonna miss it. There's also what you bringing up the thing about the familiarity and to just, I, it's it's related directly. I mean, there's a through line, but this idea of even, so we were talking about like, you know, having respect for the person, the president that even you don't like. Mm -hmm. But I know that in my lifetime, there's been this push, I think probably starting with, I think Clinton was probably the first one certainly George Bush, this was like his thing where people were like, oh, they're voting for him because they would want to have a beer with him. And I'm like, mm. and like in a good way. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm almost like, well, but that then that's a disrespect of the office of president in the same way, mm -hmm. because it's like, of that. do, do you, do you want the president to be somebody who would have a beer with you? Yeah. Like with you, the president, you want the person in the Oval Office yeah. who has got their finger on the nukes that could end the world to be, to look at you and be like, I'd have, I've had, I'd have a beer with that guy. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I want it's him to look at me and be like, he's not worth my time. It's interesting you, you bring that up, Supreme, because I remember this conversation before I was ordained, I, had, I was having this conversation with, with, uh, with, an, with a priest and a nun about that. And I was wrong, you know, I was wrong. Um, and they were very gracious to me. Cause I was like, well, no, you know, people want a measure of um, familiarity and they want to be able to, you know, relate, blah, blah, blah. And they were very gracious in correcting me. Um, and they didn't really push it, but having experience now, I definitely see I was wrong. Um, because I know, and I know of priests and clergymen who they lament not being invited to the parties anymore. And I'm like, yeah, you don't get it then because, you know, I take the absence of the invite to be actually respectful. You know, if that makes sense, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there are, there are, there are, and it's community by community. There are, there are events, right? where, you know, I, I, I hope and kind of expect to be invited to there's events, but the kind of like kickbacks and the whatever, I really, you know, I don't, you know, I, no, I don't take offense to not being invited. And again, I, I see it as respect, if that makes sense, you know, because um, this is one of the things that's really important is people being able to i think cyprian has frozen but that's okay oh um people being able to enter into that place of respecting the office you know what i mean um because this is another this is another distinction here too there's the people who are like he'll be back don't worry he'll be no back problem. yeah there's 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 the people who are like well you know i'm just just a regular guy, but it's like, okay, yes and no. Um, because it's, the priesthood isn't a job. It's, it's, it's your, it's what you are. It's like your vocation, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You could probably have a beer with T'Challa, but you better believe I'm going to try and be in my best behavior the entire time. Yeah. Like, and you out should. of respect, out of respect. Yeah. And you should, and you should, you know, um, and again, it's, it's for, I mean, like, you know me, you know, it's like, uh, welcome back. I, I'm definitely, I don't know what happened there to me. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I definitely, this is just me and maybe I'm wrong. This is one of the reasons I'm not trying to be secret is one of the reasons why someone could say, you know, they, they would question whether I'm a good priest or not. And they're probably right. But I, I do try to maintain, um, not familiar, but I, I try to be approachable 
to my flock and to people because I know that they, I know that I know my people, I know my culture, right? And I know that um, the people that God has, has put me to minister to, um, there's a measure of, there's a measure of, of being able to minister to them that I'm not able to get to if, if things are formal in a way that is intimidating. Does that, does that matter? Yeah. Well, I mean, St. John was on the breast of Christ mm -hmm. and then revelation happens. Yes. And then like, he's flat on his face. He's mm -hmm. like, you know, this is absolutely the king in his glory. I mean, there has to be this measure of like being able to meet people where they are at, being able to like to 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 condescend, if you will. And Andrew, forgive me. I just want to stop right there because you you've, you've hit a bullseye. I just I don't want us to go any further until we just come back to that. When people sure. are understanding this, because you you've summed up perfectly what what I've been stumbling over this whole episode, which is. It's really about meeting people where they're at. That doesn't that doesn't mean because that because Christ does do that, right? He just doesn't leave us there, mm. right? Mm -hmm. He just doesn't leave us there. So, meeting someone where they're at that doesn't mean that just like you're too casual, nothing care, you know. There's no dignity. It's not that at all. But it's just it's love, right? It's like, and again, I could be wrong, but I try to be gracious, loving. And, and patient with people. Because again, a broken reed, he, a bruised reed, he will not break, a smoldering flax, he will not stuff out. Just meeting people where they're at and getting them to a place to where they're encouraged. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it's like, if I, if I snap down on someone and scream at them or, or, or embarrass them improperly, they may and probably will act right, but what kind of precedent have I started in their heart? Right? Are are they are they doing something out of love now, or am I or am I actually reinforcing vainglory and vanity for them? Right? Mm -hmm. That they're like, well, I don't want to look like a fool. It's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with not wanting to look like a fool, but more importantly, don't you want to do what's the honoring thing? Don't you want to do the loving thing? towards God and towards your community. Does that, does, you, you understand what I'm saying? Well, no, and that's good because the the best, um, the, the parable that I relate to the most, the one that really strike the one I was listening to a podcast and the priest was explaining it and I was driving and oh boy, my knuckles turned white when he was talking about was being invited to the, the feast and sitting farther, sitting above your station. So like, mm -hmm. say you go sit at like the groom's table or something like that. And that waiter has to walk up and like on the thing, uh, like on the shoulder and say, Hey buddy, you're actually supposed to be way back there. So they have to lift up your plate of food and walk all the way back. And everyone knows what happened. So you look like a fool, you know, like, you, you know, you, this whole thing happened where you suddenly look like a fool, but being able to like start at a spot and like gently, like you know what I'm saying? Like, like they start in the back and then gently like nudge them forward. Like Christ will go back and like, see you in the back, but like, like gently like nudge you forward and be like, Hey, it's okay. You can, you know, why don't you try sitting over here? Why don't you try sitting over here? I don't know. That started out different in my brain, but like, I think what I'm trying to say is this, that like being able to, what's well, the parable, right? The yeah, book, sure. He gives us that parable better to, you know, we should, I don't know, we're gonna, I'm gonna misquote it, but obviously like bear to sit with humility in the back and, and versus with presumption and have to be told, you know. Sure. Why are you, why are you here? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So then the last one I got is um, crossing yourself to get like a blessing or like, so like during the kiss of peace, sometimes people will cross themselves before they come up to me to ask for my forgiveness. And that's a no, no, right? Like when you walk by like crossing yourself, like say you're sensing again, back to the sensing, if you're sensing and you walk by and you cross yourself, from what I understand that's inappropriate, correct? It's not proper. Yeah, it's not, it's generally, yeah. 
because it not, you're not a bishop you're not yeah. like a bishop you're not yeah and, and it's you know like you know icon you know um and people it happens people do it again this is one of those things where it's like i don't want people being mortified this is this this stuff is great but it's also tough because i just know for some people and you know god bless them maybe it's part of the vanity they'd be shocked out of but like it can mortify them but like yeah you know like you don't um so there's a thing of like blessing others right which that's what that's the thing people keep like parents will bless their children He's talking about like doing this right yeah, making the sign of the cross over their kid or like you know um that's 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 good you know um but in regards of you know uh making like if you come if you come and ask for a blessing from your confessor like, oh follow your blessing like don't make the sign of the cross and then ask for a blessing right just you know make your bow if you want to do that but but just you know you take your hand left hand put your right hand top of it father bless you know you get the blessing from the priest the priest you know you kiss the priest hand uh, the hand of christ that, that's good um there's no need to like cross yourself to get the to get the blessing right? okay cool um, like it's just not necessary yes but but here's the other thing though too and again this is why um we don't say we don't yell out amen although in our parish we have dave's right who do amen. yell in dave's it's, awesome dave's awesome we love dave right um but don't you do it you know what i mean it's so like we let dave do it because we love dave but if andrew did it it would be weird right like just a great example of piety right um uh so we don't yell out amen but instead what we do is make the sign of the cross. And this is why some people be like, I hear this all the time, catechumens. Well, when do I make the sign of the cross? Because I see people making it at different times all the time. So I have to explain to them, well, because people who are in the service praying, they will hear something in the hymnography. Something will come to them in prayer and they will make the sign of the cross as like, you know, in the same way that's that something hits somebody in the Pentecostal or the Baptist church, like, amen, you know what I mean? You make the sign of the cross as a sign of like, Lord have mercy, right? So that's why there isn't this kind of like, there is a standard, right? When in the invocation of the Trinity, we always cross ourselves. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Let's cross ourselves. Um, invocation of the saints especially the patron of a community you cross yourself you know what i mean like there's these moments you cross yourself and right even icon you cross yourself you know um there's kind of a when in doubt cross yourself yeah when in doubt cross yourself you know like it's never going to be like and if someone does this you know if someone corrects someone in a, in a way that isn't you know fatherly like shame on them whatever it's just like you know like when someone's ready be like oh it's okay my dear at this point in time you don't have to you know what i mean like it, someone should be corrected with this in a spirit of gentleness um i was gonna say something about that at the end it's like if you find yourself getting a little ego boost from it then yeah like maybe don't do it i mean that's my experience uh if you like correct someone and you're like ooh, i kind of like that like yeah you know what can i just want can we talk about this real quick yeah um this is a general rule of thumb that i would give to any of my spiritual children who are in a place where they want to grow um and i i have to say that because like that's another thing not everyone's in a place where they want to grow that's just a fact right um but i would say the rule of thumb in correcting people is number one do you have authority over that person mm. right um and number two are you correcting them for the benefit of that person or are you correcting them because you're annoyed mm. right those two things not one or the other if you don't have those two things together don't correct someone so um that's that's a good standard for correcting people is that that's oh, good does that, that makes sense you know oh, it's good because yeah you can fall into something to being like well i am correcting someone on like 
the holy orthodox church you know like i'm doing something good here it's like i don't know about that i mean sometimes it can be and, and someone's gonna disagree with me which is fine you know um but i i would just i would offer this you know it's like again um if you really break down what i just said there it, it kind of covers your bases you know what i mean um because and again for the fifth time i'm 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 obviously not the model priest but i would just say this i fear god um and that all being said, you know, the reason why I don't correct people in the way that some others might think I should or don't is because I do fear God, right? Um, <laughs> lest I have a millstone tied around my neck and I'm thrown into the sea. Better that happen than I stumble one of these little ones, you know what I mean? Um, and there's, don't get me wrong, anyone who knows me too, not that it's about me, I don't think I'm a, I don't think I'm a piece of cotton candy. I mean, no. <laughs> you know, someone might be hearing this, someone might stumble on and think, oh, I think I'm some kind of whatever. Like, no, I, I have no problem correcting someone if, if it's needed, you know, but I, 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 you know, I try not to correct people out of annoyance and, and out of like my own vanity. Like I try to correct, my rule for correcting someone is like, if they continue on this path, will it be destructive before the, for them and for others around them, right? Um, are they able to receive this correction? You know what I mean? Like, what I'm trying to get at is, is I'm in a place where, I, where not only do I have the authority, but I need to correct people, and I'm not throwing them out like hotcakes, right? I, I, pray, I try to pray for people. I try to pray for the Holy Spirit to show me the right opportunities to correct people so that it will bear fruit, Right, because if you're correcting people just because you or whatever, um, it's not going to bear, at least not going to bear good fruit. It might very well bear bad fruit, but it won't bear good fruit. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've and like the Holy Spirit has a way of working on people because, like I said, things just started to feel wrong. And I mean, I don't say this out as like some kind of false humility. I generally say like, I'm not the most in tune person. And like, if I can get corrected, he obviously has a way of working with people to correct them. I'm not trying to be like, oh, with this wretched sinner, like literally like there are times where stuff is just going on right in front of me. I'm just not seeing it. I'm just not in tune. And so like, if I can be corrected, if I can like literally be like, it's just feeling weird to do that then like I go to father like a couple weeks later and say, like, Hey father, it's probably not good for me to do this. And he'd be like, yeah, God bless you. Don't do that. And that's pretty much it. Like, you know, that, that tends to be how some of the stuff goes down, you know? So I got two quick ones for you, father, when you are going up for communion and you have your hands in your chest, is it right over left or left over right oh. against your chest? Did you say something? No, oh. I'm fine. I'm listening. Well, you think of it this way, right? When you bring your arms down, if you were to receive a blessing, how would that look? Left over right. Like, okay, cool. But again, you know, when in Constantinople. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I, you know, um, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Then uh, last one I have is what constitutes holy trash? Yeah, so this is... I'm sorry, I'm sorry you glitched there. What did you say? Holy trash? Yeah, yeah holy trash. Yeah. Okay. So um, this, is a, <laughs> this is a thing where unfortunately there's so many, there's so many communities that don't even have this concept, unfortunately. Um, like I've known communities where they just throw icon, like they'll print full colored icons on their bulletins and just throw them in the trash. You know what I mean? Like that's it. Um, yeah, anything with like an icon on it. Um, definitely something that has been like in contact with, with holy sacramental things, you know? Um, like for instance, um, You know, if I like, there's um, 
if I've used paper towels to clean the altar, like if oil had spilt there, you know, um, the altar itself, you know, or like um, if I like, you know, I have chalices that I'll, you know, you've seen where I'll use different chalices depending on the, the size of the, the communicants, you know, if, if one's been up there for a little bit longer, might have some dust, you know, I'll clean it off with some rose water or some oil water. But that paper towel, if I use a paper towel, I'll, I'll have, I'll burn that versus just tossing it in the trash. So yeah, that was the second part was what do you do with holy trash as yeah, opposed to just regular yeah, trash? Burn holy trash. Okay. You burn it and mm-hmm. make the, I'm, I asked you this one time, so I'm sorry, but you make like the sign of the cross over the fire and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I, I make the sign of the cross, you know, and light oh. it up. Yeah, you know. and, so it, and, it, and again, and again, there's some people who are like, I've been Orthodox 150 years. I've never heard that. Well, God bless you. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. so that would be like a cup that you used to drink holy water out of like a little dixie cup like in our parish we have like holy water at the front for people in the choir or if you're struggling and you need like a little extra blessing you just drink a little bit of holy water you take that cup and you throw it in a special trash can right next to it which is that i couldn't like throw like the tissue i used to like wipe my son's snotty nose in that same trash no separate trash for that yeah but like if if um uh, that, that's the example I'm going to use. The holy water. Palms, palms from Palm Sunday, right? Awesome. The they eggshells from Pascha. There's a special bucket that we had for the eggshells because they're blessed eggs. Right. Don't want to just throw them in the trash or throw them on the ground or something like that. There's a special place for that stuff. Right. So I mean, and so you can even get into a thing where it's like, and again, it's just all where you're at, you know, but just, um, I mean, even like St. Paisas would talk about like, he would, you know, like food blessed food not throwing it away you know and that's why it's a good habit to have compost so blessed food as in a, i have blessed my food like yeah, my and house. like instead of just scraping your leftovers in the trash scrape it into the compost like in Whatever. particular see, see i've been corrected just now i'll say another thing too don't ever 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 pour holy water down the drain oh yeah well no no not, oh yeah, because I've known people who've done that. In fact, St. Paisius, he talks about like a woman became possessed from, from doing that, you know? Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure so I've like, done it. I'm sure I've done it. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's just, and again, it's one of those things like, so this is where it's tough because we're like, this all just sounds like a bunch of superstitious hooey. And you know what? For some people, it might be that because there might be some people who their orthodoxy is so... To, like divorced from the person of Christ and the saints. That's a thing. That's a thing. You know, um, Marina gro- wrote her uh, wrote a paper in her undergrad on this, on the some some kind of aberration of of etiquette being birthed out of a lack of catechism because of the fall of communism. It's a really good paper, actually. But yeah, there's there's a whole thing where it's just like. Um, I like I gave the, she gave the example of like when she was um, uh, I can't remember where Saint Matrona where she went to like venerate her relics I think it is and it's like oh well, why do you do this like oh because it's good for your health it's like uh, like yeah it's good for your health but like aren't you doing it to honor the saint who like you know what I mean who, who was you sure. know Im- imbued with like the grace of God you know what I'm saying so like so this is this is a thing too where it's like yeah. I mean, that stuff does exist where people can get like superstitious with this. And so that's why, it, again, it has to be with love, you know, and, you know, um, Stevie Wonder, you know, the great Stevie Wonder, what did he say, right? Um, when you believe in things you don't understand, superstition, you know? So like, that's that's something, that's a good measure too. It's like, and that's why I don't, when people want to ask questions, like, I love people asking questions, but they have to be ready for an answer. And what I mean by that is um, you're not like, this gets into a whole nother conversation in regards of like, it, where some people fall into magical thinking. Mm. And what I mean by magic, see, this is another thing. 
when I talk about magical thinking, I'm not talking about like wishful thinking. When I mean by magical, I mean like with a K. Where it's just like, I do this at this point in time, I do this, and like, you know, like like it's sorcery, where it's just like, you do a this. formula, the alchemical formula. The, alch yeah. the formulaic thing. That's what you mean by magical, magical thinking. And some people take piety in that sense and it's, it's not correct. They'll treat icons like they're good luck charms or they'll, you know what I mean? It's like, you have to do this because I, you know, I said this prayer correctly and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, that's, that's, that's magic. That's, that's I'd, magic. I'd heard there's a superstition that if you look at a picture of St. Christopher or an icon, rather, I'm sorry, of St. Christopher, you can't die that day. And it's just like, that's, that's um, ludicrous. Yeah, that's ludicrous. It's maybe, it's, it's probably what it is. It's probably based in something actually holy. But then it got warped and you know divorced from its true meaning at some point, and then someone's like, "Well, you know, it's like a, it's like a bad, it's like a black cat walks in front of you, you're gonna have bad luck or something." Now I want to say this though, because on the one hand, we you know it would be disingenuous and wrong to not acknowledge where there are abuses, where abuses there's a potential for abuse because there is, you know what I mean? I mean, um, iconoclasm part of what caused iconoclasm to come into play were abuses of this nature. Now, the other side of that though, is that all of us who actually come into the church, and I don't just mean become members of the institution, but become members of the living like organism, you know, the body of the church, we begin to see this metaculture we begin to experience a dignity. We begin to experience a, a vision, a potential, and, 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 and again, just what it means to be human, which is none of us thought it was possible. That's real. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's real. So just, you have to be patient. So yeah. You have to be humble. I like key thing is you gotta be humble. You have to be humble. It's like that part, I think I've referenced it in this podcast before, in The Force Awakens, the Star Wars, the uh, Star Wars movie where Han Solo is like the force, the dark side and the light, it's all real. Like all of it's real. And they're just like, whoa. It's just like, yeah, it's a little bit like, it's all real. It's all there. Like you were raised to think it's not, but it is. So Cyprian, do you have any questions? That was my list. I, I don't. I actually think we're coming up on two hours. Here. We are, yeah, which yeah. is good timing. I don't I don't have any, but those were all great, I must say. Yeah. I had a little I had a little internet, Saipan internet issue uh during some of that, but I think I got most of it and it was uh, sure. those were all very helpful. And very again, helpful to me. I just want everybody to point uh, to realize in this very podcast, I got corrected about something. I did not know about throwing away blessed food. I didn't know that. And that's okay. You know, it's not a big deal. It just means I'm gently corrected. Doesn't mean that, I mean, I, you know, maybe I'll take it to confession and be like, I didn't know. I'm sorry. You know, it's, that's one of those things. How was I to know, you know, there's a limit to that. Obviously I shouldn't just walk up to father and just like, I don't know, like smack him on the butt and say, what's up father. You know, like, you know, obviously there's a limit to that, but like, there is this like I there's no way I could have really known that I mean of course now that father said that of course that's true of course yeah I shouldn't throw away food I ask God to bless like you know put it in an appropriate spot so and I do have a spot that's right beneath a tree where I dump you know blessed stuff so or I you know burn it but you can't burn holy water it doesn't work that way so um so if there are no more questions I have to ask you guys just be silly. Doesn't have to be a real thing because obviously famous people aren't great. But if you guys had to take a 12 hour road trip with someone famous, who would it be? That they had to have been alive in the last hundred years. Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla. That's a good one. Wasn't he supposed to be a priest? And then I had heard that. I he had, had a that, stomach yeah. he had having stomach problems and the minute he's decided not to be a priest his stomach problems went away yeah i haven't heard that but sure yeah i mean it'd be better than thomas edison yeah 
<sighs> Satoshi Nakamoto. You kidding me? Oh, oh yeah. Satoshi Nakamoto. Yeah. Absolutely for me. Yeah. <laughs> There's no question. Yeah. Yeah. No question. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect answer for me. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. And then we're just right on theme with all of us. Mine would probably be Frank Miller. There you go. I think Frank Miller would be an excellent guy. Just keep him away from the booze because he's Irish and angry. And I would just be like, hey, man. Just- Can I say something? You know what was interesting was it was assumed. It, it, it was just assumed that we also like weren't going to answer with the saint. I thought immediately of like, well, obviously, if I'm not being silly, it would be St. Paisios or St. Porphyrios or you maybe St. Defroni. Oh, the old is like sin. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I but don't yeah. think I'm I don't think I'm ready for a 12 hour trip. With I don't think I could do that. I, I think I could be ready for maybe a half hour with any of those guys. I don't think I'm ready. I, I think at 12, 12 hours, I think I'd be a mess. So you're in the car. I think I'd be a puddle. Like you're puddle. in the you're in the car with St. Silouan and you start getting hungry and you stop at a gas station to get food. What do you get? Like, what do you buy? I would just be and like, water. yeah, I was going to say something. <laughs> you buy bread and water. Bread and water. <laughs> Maybe get some salt. Yeah. <laughs> because I feel like anything above that, he's just going to be like, mm, okay, yeah. sure. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever you want to get. <laughs> But yeah, Frank Miller would be fun because then uh, I could also have him draw me something. I'm assuming I'm driving. So then be like, yeah, could you just, you know, work up a sketch real quick? So anyway, okay. Um, so I so I think still on theme, I think that people ask questions and they would like them answered within reason. I think that next week we'll try and shoot for an actual questions and answers. But the etiquette thing has continued to come up over and over again. And I just got to say, I'm just the layman here. That's the only perspective I can offer. End of end of thought, period. Or not end of thought, but period, full stop. But I can say that, like, um, again, I, the, I don't, my perspective is, is, like, I think when I was not doing well, when I was not really trying to pursue, like, a closeness with Christ, um, and I wanted the comfort of the church and not, not the work, uh, not the sacrifice i was very much um thought that these were finger wagging rules um that these are just like you know i guess we could if they, we had more time we could break down what the word etiquette really means um but uh the only thing i have to say is is that like again a lot of this stuff has been pointed out to me out of a out of like a spirit of love not at a spirit of judgment never had a priest stop the liturgy come out and told me you know i'm doing something wrong and embarrassed me in front of everyone um and i've never had like uh a person correct me in a way that was harsher than i meant to do and if they even if they did and they're not clergy like you know that really does say more about them than it does about you um because if the priest the priest is not correcting something that you're doing and um a per and a layman does out of a spirit of like anger or kind of like maybe like well i can't believe you don't know this you know blah 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 then there's something wrong with that spirit and that's not what really what i was trying to encourage at all with this conversation i was really just like you know there's there's lots of these little things and i guess i just wish someone had pointed that out to me too and then i will say this is the last thing i'll say it's incredibly difficult i essentially father and i and cyprian at one point all live in babylon pretty much like america is babylon like um you know it it's incredibly difficult not to just change to with god's help to change your attitude towards god and towards religion and towards piety and honor and like actual like the dignity of like an office of something but like not only that but like to actually have like um to actually be able to go into like thousands of or a year, a church with thousands of years of tradition and be able to just like pick it up all in one day without some correction, without some help is just, that's, that's silly, you know? And so just, you know, you're going to be wrong. And that's the wonderful thing about being Orthodox is you're just allowed to be wrong. You know, you can just be wrong. It's okay. Like, 
as long as you are able to accept the measure of like correction and being able to learn from it, then you're all good. So I'll go ahead and step off my, my, uh, my soapbox. So good, man. I, well, I just want to say, I appreciate, I appreciate this episode and the idea. And I think that no, not even I think. I know that there are quite a few people in the audience who this is going to be quite helpful to because it was it was helpful to me. And I and I know there are people who listen who are within my circle who were just who are either catechumens now or were just even baptized this last week, which is fantastic. And I know that this is exactly the type of episode that that they will all be thankful that was there. So it was good on you. Fantastic. Good on you. Father, any last words? Christ is risen. <laughs> and truth is risen. Indeed. Nice. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for having a good night. <laughs>